So, um, I, up, I put up on the repository, and I don't think we've pulled yet again, but on uh, Clip Bucket, I should have pushed up a today's class script. So if we go to bitbucket.org, and if we sign in, And it should be about that uh, repositories. All right, so if you look at your own one, um, if you go to bitbucket.org, it should say that your fork is one commit behind. Might be more commits behind, but at least one commit, because I did some stuff. Um, so if you go on there, and over here, you hit sync now, and press sync it should sync um, yours with the master. So now it merged into uh, yours, what the master tea time is. And now we need to go to uh, Git Bash. And you gotta make up your way all the way in Git Bash all the way over. Some examples again. So CD has changed directory. So if I did ls right here, it'd say I'm in my git directory, and I'm going to cd over into 16, and I'm going to do just the straight up master um, sdlet type. I'll go in there. So now what you guys will want to do is you'll want to do a git pull, and for mine it's going to say it's already up to date, um, but for yours it should hopefully pull, pull down. down the new class. Okay. Um, so I don't know if anybody's trying that. Let me know if you guys are able to do it, because it won't help not to have it <laughs> before we keep on going, going on. So, so did that work for everyone? Um, I think one, one issue that you may have is if you made some changes in your own repository and you haven't added them and committed them and then pushed them, it might get mad at you and say you need to, or that you need to pull and then push. Yeah, always pull and push. So actually a pull should be perfectly fine. You should always be able to pull. Um, sometimes you can't push unless you've already pulled. Question? No, yeah. Has anyone been able to pull it down? Okay, so we have some people who have pulled it down. All right, cool. Um, so if, if you haven't pulled it down and you have any questions, let me know. We'll make sure you get it. Um, I didn't put one on the drive to try to help everybody really want to start using um, Bitbucket and Git Bash, which is and well, your terminal, because um, that's kind of some of the ideas here. So um, today's gonna be about linear regression, and I'm kind of excited about this one because there's a lot of interesting things uh, with linear regression um, and basically making your computer a tool for yourself. Um, uh, Amit was the one who uh, put about 75% of this together and I finished off the other 25%. So he gets all the credit for uh, making most of this. Um, so we, we had shown a couple classes ago a really brief thing about linear regression. Now we're gonna go through it in um, total. And I, didn't, I just made one T time class three. Um, I didn't make one that had stuff deleted out of it because there's a lot of things you gotta kinda of type in in here and kind of a lot of things we wanna get through so I figured hopefully we have a decent understanding of syntax and now we can just kinda of roll through some examples. 
Um, so the first thing in the script is to uh, install data sets if you don't have it installed yet, and then library in uh, data sets. Uh, data sets has MT cars, which we've used before in the class, um, and that is our all our different cars with miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of what that is. Um, there's some comments in here, we might skip some of them. Uh, if we attach MT cars, uh, it's going to um, attach it to our data so we can call it different times. So now we can ask what is the range, which is a function of the weight column of MT cars. Um, so again, the attach function, what it does is it takes your data frame and it attaches each individual column as an array data set. So we can say, okay, what's weight? And it will analyze weight. So we can take the range, we can look at the standard deviation. Um, and so now the next thing is that when you're making a linear model, uh, you typically want it to be normally uh, distributed. Um, and then some other things as well. So I'm gonna put in kind of this cool graph and show you real, uh, real quick um, that plots out I'll just run through the whole thing. A nice, and this is this is something you can always do in R, and if you did it in ggplot, it'd look even nicer. Um, but a nice figure that shows you uh, what the meaning of a normal distribution is, um, centered around uh, the mean, and then uh, standard deviations uh, within one, and then two, and so when we look at some of the data sets, when we fit them, we should see that most of the data is pretty close, and then we have some outliers going out there, and smaller percent. Um, right? uh, so actually in making that figure right there, there's some interesting functions that, uh, so it's called segment. And so what segment does is it um, starts at some value on your plot that you specify, and then uh, at an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and then it ends at another X and Y coordinate. In this case, we're making two segments, so they have multiple values in there. Um, you can look at it a little bit more, but that is one of the functions we use, which is kind of useful in plotting. Um, another one in here is expression. And so expression, uh, you can use it when you're making labels or titles. Uh, you can put together some text, and then expression has a list of different variables that will come out as characters. So in this case, um, we put the character in sigma, and so when we look at the plot, uh, sigmas were in there. So then it looks a little bit nicer. Instead of writing within three and then actually typing out sigma. Right? So moving from that, we'll go into some simple linear regression. Um, so first thing, let's just plot the weight versus the miles per gallon. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Alright, so here's um, miles per gallon, weight. We've seen this before because we've looked at this data set a couple times. Um, there's distribution of da data. Uh, we can probably fit a linear regression to that to kind of predict what different um, miles per gallon would be determined on the <coughs> weight, which I think is in some uh, thousands of pounds or maybe it's hundreds of kilograms. I don't know, I can't remember. Um, so now we're gonna make a lin linear model and it's really easy to do with the LM function in R, which is linear model. And so we're gonna say we want, as our y variable, we want miles per gallon, and the tilde sign says start formula. So it says start a formula, and let's put in weight as an x variable. And we'll save that into the object model. Okay, so we run that. Um, we should have over in here, I have a lot of stuff kind of sitting here. So we have a model that has now popped into the environment and it has a lot of different things in it. Um, and so miles per gallon is the y, weight is the x, and it creates a, a linear regression with a slope intercept a <laughs> plus b times the weight, which is x. Um, and it can also have, and that also has an error term in there. So if we look at the summary of the model using the function summary on the model. So weight is your predictor and y is your response. Yes, yep. And so if we look at the model here, it'll tell us what we called. So we wanted to do an LM of the formula miles per gallon 
as the response and the predictor is weight. Um, it told us some things about the residuals in there, the minimum of them, uh, the median and the max residual, uh, some other things about the coefficients. So what was our intercept? It's 37.285. Um, and then our weight coefficient was negative 5.3445. So what that is saying is that as weight increases, we're seeing a decrease in miles per gallon, which makes sense because we need more power to move um, that through more energy. Uh, it also has the error on each particular component, um, a t-value um, to measure um, some of the statistical significance, and then also uh, um, this pr and p-value, which is basically saying, I think p-value less than 0 0.05 is the standard okay, it's a decent model, though I guess that's disputed. Um, but this one looks to be, hey, pretty good. It's 1.29 times 10 to the negative 10, so pretty good. Um, and then also our two important parameters here is that multiple R squared and adjusted R squared. So multiple R squared is your standard R squared. How well is it fitting? What are the residuals there? Well, adjusted R squared looks at how many parameters are you using in your model um, and some other things too. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, as we add more parameters, we may increase our multiple R squared, but actually decrease our adjusted R squared because we're giving it more knobs and buttons to turn to make the model fit what we want. Um, so that's kind of everything in the summary right there. It's kind of nice. Uh, we can ask the model just what are the coefficients straight up, intercept and weight. Um, and we can also ask what is the conf er, um, confidence interval from uh, 95% and it'll give us um, down to 2.5% mark and then also 97.5%. Um, so those are just some nice things to use. And then we can also use the function abline model which creates a line through your plot showing what the fitted values are for all your val values in the in the model. So this is our linear regression that we've created. This is the original data that's in there. So pretty simple, pretty easy to do. A uh, really relatively small amount of functions that you have to use here. Um, so now we can do a little bit more, just kind of to show some things. Uh, let's plot it again. We'll make it look a little bit nicer. Um, make this bigger again. Uh, so in the plotting function here we had um, uh, weight and miles per gallon in there, and then uh, our character type, color, X label, Y label, and then the limits that we want to look on here. Um, if we use the function par, so par is a graphical parameter, and par um, parentheses new equals true means that let's keep the same graph and add something on top of it. So we're going to say, all right, we're going to plot again on it, and we want to put the ab line on. So now we have our line on there again. And we can do one more thing. And on top of it, we want to add the fitted model. So basically what happened with the linear regression was that each time that it saw one of, it made its linear regression and then fitted each value. So for every red dot corresponds to a particular X value, and then the green dot is where is it sitting on the line. So for every red dot here, we have what the actual fitted value of um, the linear regression is. So that's nice to see. And then one final one that we can add on top of it using the segments um, function. And we're throwing into it um, x naught, where does it start, uh, is just the weight. And where and y naught, where does it start, is mile per gallon. And then uh, where does it end, that same x value, which is weight. And the y value, where does it end, is going to be the fitted model. So if we run this, um, let me make sure that this is true, it's going to make some lines showing us the distance between the fitted model and our original data that we have. So just kind of nice visual to see. Um, and we can look at this in some other ways. Those red lines are actually the residuals. So what's left over after we make the model, what's the possible error in there. Um, so uh, the residuals are in there. Let's see where I have the... Um, I think it comes a little bit later. I'm going to jump real quick because I think it's 
we tend to do it, we can plot the model. So we look like we plotted the model, but we've put it, plotted the values. We can look at some plots of the model. So if you hit that plot model and hit return, as it says to see next plot, we can start assessing, oops. We can start assessing what the different um, kind of fit parameters and what are the residuals and how does it look? How can we assess this? We can look at these plots. So the first one is um, the residuals versus, versus the fitted values. Um, residuals being here and then the fitted. So at the values of um, <clears throat> miles per gallon of 20, so miles per gallon's down here, we're seeing some kind of high residuals over here, also some high over there. Um, and then it just puts a, um, a spline through it to kind of show, you know, where do we have the most residuals? We'd probably say those are kind of some high residuals and the sum of everything that's happened. Um, and the next one, uh, we have a um, normal, I think quantile, quantile plot. And what you want to see in this is you really want to see everything being nice along this line. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of flares out towards the end, which can be okay, but sometimes if they tail off too much, say as in right here where it kind of is really going, that may not be a good thing. Um, I don't know the complete statistics on it, but this is, this helps you. Um, you want to see it go right along there. The next one um, is uh, the scale location, uh, which tells you basically what are some of the ones that are kind of really far away. Um, our 20th value, our 18th value, and our 17th value tend to be the farthest away in the residuals after we um, scale them. And then the last plot is residuals versus leverage. So in this one, um, it's showing that what are the standardized re residuals and then how much leverage do they have on the model. So in one case, you can have a ton of points kind of going along the line and then one point, one outlier, really, really far away. Well, that point is going to have a lot of leverage on the model and try to pull that line up. Um, so in this case, by doing this and looking at the residuals and the leverage that we have in there, we can see that point 17 um, is sub substantially out there and is a point of leverage. So maybe we want to look at it and determine why is this an outlier? Is it a, is it a messed up point or is it something that we should note and understand? So this is, this is a really useful plot to look at. Um, I think Cook's distance, I don't really know, but I'm pretty sure that you should be inside of Cook's distance and not outside of it, um, is usually what uh, starts to show your points of leverage. Also shows that these two points, 18 and 20, also have a lot of leverage. All right, so we'll get out of that. So those are the four plots that you can have in there. Um, and now if we go back and look at this again, um, this doesn't necessarily look linear. Um, I think using the eye test, we see that it's going down, but it kind of starts to tail off. Um, if we think about this and how that slope was before, let's see if I can get it up again. Typically the intercept isn't worth too much because all of a sudden at weight past five, whatever weight is, we're now getting negative miles per gallon and that's a non-physical thing. Um, so looking at this, the slopes, nice to know, but the intercept doesn't necessarily tell us anything. It's saying that at best we could only expect 30 um, miles per gallon and we're gonna start getting negative values later. So we know that's not really a physical thing um, and we can do some other things to check out the model. Um, so you gotta come back down here. Um, so now we can do some multiple linear regression uh, and that's just adding additional parameters into the model. And the way that this works, and we'll call it model two, um, so LM, miles per gallon again, formula, and we're just gonna simply put plus horsepower. So we just add in how we want uh, mathematics. Now you always have to use plus because it will determine the coefficient which will be negative. I'll show you what negative does a little bit later. Um, well, negative actually takes a variable out of the model, um, and there's a particular time when you would use that. So here we can run this again make model two, um, and we can look at the summary of model two. And in here it says, okay, our formula was miles per gallon as a function of weight and horsepower. Um, it came up with the intercepts, um, or with the intercept and the two slope values. 
Um, horsepower has a, has a low um, co coefficient there um, compared to something like weight. Um, now we can look at the significance codes over here and it's saying that the intercept is pretty significant. Um, more stars the better. So this is really significant and then not so significant. Um, and then it says that horsepower, yeah, it has some significance that might be good to have in there. That's all right. Um, but now our R squared has gone up to 8.3 essentially <laughs> and our adjusted R squared is at 0.8148. Um, compared to the previous model, which we'll run right here, um, which was 0.75 and 0.74. So we've increased the adjusted R squared by a reasonable amount. Um, I believe that's point, uh, if we looked at the adjusted R squared, 0.74 to 0.81, that's about 7%, which is pretty good. Um, and you always want to be comparing adjusted R squares. So yes. Like... Yep. Adjusted R squares are the ones that you want to compare. You can maybe peek over at your R squared, but you can make your R squared in a lot of cases really, really high by just adding more variables to your model over and over and over again. Um, but your adjusted R takes into account for those and kind of tells you, whoa, hold off. Those, those variables you're putting in there don't really mean anything. So that's the nice thing with adjusted R. All right, so moving forward here. I know I has some things about F stat. Um, I'm not really sure what the F statistic does, but there's a sentence here that'll let you know what it does. Um, on the nose. Um, and then like we were talking, adjusted R squared pays a price for the inclusion of more and more variables. Um, all right, so now we'll kind of move over into another one. Now, uh, this is actually where Using the parameter, the graphical parameter par, mf rho equals, allows you to put multiple figures in one plot window. So this is saying that let's do two rows and two columns. We run that, and if we plot it, it puts all those plots that we were looking at before. So we can look at them all at the same time now. So we've got, um, so not really doing anything new except for changing the graphical parameter. Well, if you have more than uh, four locations, um, so if you had, let's say you had nine graphs you wanted, you do three by three. No, no, no. let's say you, you but say you had nine. For this. Yeah, so if you, let's say that you had nine graphs you wanted to do and you put two by two, it'll plot the first four and then actually it'll plot them, it'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you'd have nine, six, seven, eight plotted on here. Because it will just, it starts and then it just keeps going. So now if you didn't have enough, if you only have one plot, um, it would only, uh, if you only plotted one and you had it set up for a four by four, it'd just come up here. But it goes one, two, three, four. So if you don't have enough or have too many, it will overwrite. Um, so you do have to be careful of that. Can if you you're like. plot function for GG plots? So like you would use that function to apply it to the GG plot? Yeah, so GG plot, I haven't used. Par. Um, what I've used for ggplot mostly is a function called multiplot, which I think we had last time. And multiplot basically, you tell it how many figures you want in there, how many plots, and then you have to specify, I want this many columns and this many rows. So in that case, it would never overwrite because it has to solve the problem for you. Um, that's a piece of it. If you put uh, if you didn't put enough figures for all the different rows and columns you had, it'd just make a couple of them bigger to fill the gaps. I don't think it'll overwrite. It's just going to show you some case. This one? Yeah, so, just that example, if you have a nine plot type, but you, you set two, two. So let's see. If I run this plot, it, it resets and just puts the one up there. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the case where you only put one plot in, and it's set up for two but now if I plotted just this one, it's going to come up in the next one. And if I plotted just the Abilene, uh, Abilene always plots on the last one. So um, if I did that, and did this again, and then did this again, 
Yeah, so every so it doesn't overwrite. Yeah, yeah, it just you can starts go back, back to the last page. So yeah. That's what you have. yeah, so I guess in the case of nine, it just shows you the last one. Yeah. And that's it. But yes, you can go to the last page if you would like to. So yeah, you can keep on flipping through your past plots. Um, they won't go away. But let's say if you were printing to a device, I'm not really sure what would happen. So if you want to print the figures as PNG, you might run into some issues. But whenever you're actually printing your plots to use for stuff, you know, you'll pay attention a little bit more. But yeah, thanks, nice catch. Um, so let's see, where were we? Um, there's some other things that you can do to look at your models. So we can look at the two different models that we made, model one and model two, and we can um, do AIC um, statistics, look at those. Uh, basically, I'm pretty sure for AIC, you want a lower AIC value, and so 156 is better, and that's the second model we made, which had the extra horsepower. In it. Um, we can also do the um, Bayesian information criteria, and this one also says that the second one um, is better. I'm not really sure what the difference between AIC and um, BIC is, but they're commonly used to you know, justify your models. Um, so now we can keep on going and try to get a little bit more into some more complex ones. Um, we've used Psych before, and so if we use Psych to plot all the panels in here, we can do some quick early data analysis, exploratory, exploratory data analysis. We can kind of look at the different things that are going on here and maybe say, well, you know, we used weight here, and that was with miles per gallon. Well, what if we threw in horsepower and displacement, um, and maybe even uh, whatever drag is? I can't remember exactly what it is, or Q seconds. So we've got all these other ones. Let's think about how we can put those in there. Um, I'm going to attach this again. I think before it got messed up on me. Um, so if we plot it again, we're looking at this one. Um, I forgot I'm actually going into polynomial first here. We can make a polynomial plot. So the way that you're able to do this is with the function poly um, of whatever variable, whoops, and to what degree do you want to fit it to. So in this case, let's do poly squared. Um, so if I run that, it'll make a um, model for me. And if I look at the summary, can tell me I did poly and I did to the second. Now over here in our coefficients, the first one is poly weight two and it says one. What that means is that means that's the first value. So weight to the first order plus weight to the second order. So the second order is your second one down here. Um, so it, it sets it up and um, takes all the prior ones that you had and doesn't kind of get rid of them. So this is gonna include both of them and the intercept so you have your entire quadratic equation in there. Um, it's gonna tell us all the different coefficients and it's saying that our adjusted R squared is 0 0.8066, which is not as good as the model that we had that had just weight, linear, and, and then also um, horsepower. So we can make those type of models. See, I think I had a little bit more on this one. Uh, we can look at the coefficients again. We can plot this one back out, how we were doing kind of similarly before. Put the fitted ones. So now we see that the fitted, the fitted values are along some um, quadratic curve uh, rather than the other ones. This one now, you might say, okay, the adjusted R squared isn't as good, but it's not giving a non-physical um, intercept down there where you're going to negative miles per gallon. Well, maybe it's better. Um, but, probably not. Um, and then we can throw in our segments too to show the differences um, in here. Abline doesn't work for a polynomial fitting. I don't know why. I'm just trying to get it work and just gave up. But, um, nope. I can't stop the darn thing. Swipe down.